Truth Plus Media. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Iconic Sonics. I'm Mike Gastineau, and Iconic Sonics, the show dedicated to the Sonics and their great fans, is brought to you this year by Rise Above, a nonprofit organization that educates Washington's native youth through sports and especially basketball. NativeYouthRiseAbove.org. Find out more about this great organization. Our show is also brought to you by Epic Seats, a trusted local business who has tickets to the events you love in Seattle. Epic Seats. Dot com. Nothing beats Epic Seats. Iconic Sonics is also brought to you by Swinomish Casino and Lodge. Get up to Anacortes and visit the beautiful Casino and Lodge today. And by Dick's Drive-Ins, Great Burgers, Real Washington Potatoes, Hand Dip Shakes, and eight great Seattle area locations. Our show today features a guy who had two very memorable seasons in Seattle in the early and mid 90s. When Kendall Gill arrived, there were high hopes. It didn't all work out, but Kendall Gill helped this team win a lot of games and again, spent two memorable seasons here in Seattle. He'll spend a memorable time visiting today with our correspondent and guest host, Chris Daniels. Here's Kendall Gill and Chris Daniels. Guys, take it away. All right, guys, we are here now with Kendall Gill, a guy who I remember fondly from the the mid '90s, as I sit here and look out at Seattle Center and uh, what used to be Seattle Center Coliseum, then Key Arena, now Climate Pledge. I mean, the, this resume, Kendall, that you have is far better than mine. NBA Rookie <laughs> All First Team, NBA Steals Leader in 1999, most steals in one game with 11. 11 steals in a game, yes, and scored 12,914 points in the NBA, otherwise known as 12,914 more points than me. And of course, <laughs> with the Supersonics back in the mid-90s, uh, Kendall, thank you for joining us here on Iconic Sonics. How are you? Oh, um, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, really appreciate you guys reaching out to me. Uh, you know, Seattle, you know, I tell people that Seattle has the I'm, I'm a little bit partial to Chicago because I'm from Chicago. <laughs> yeah. But Seattle, in my opinion, has the the second best fans in the league <laughs> <laughs> uh, or they used they used to. I mean, I'm sure they still have great fans with the Seahawks and with the Mariners and everything. But, you know, my experience there with the Sonics, the, the fans were second to, to none, really. I mean, they, they, they were so loud, so into the game. They, they, they knew the game of basketball. Um, you know, it's just a shame that there's no NBA team there now. We'll get to that. But I, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to start even way back before the Sonics. Mm -hmm. I remember you, you just said Chicago. Uh, you were on those great fighting Illini teams. Mm -hmm. uh, that part of a great team in 89 with, with Nick Anderson and Marcus Liberty and Kenny Battle. Final four team that actually played in Seattle. Was that at the Old Kingdom? Was that your first visit? That was my first visit to Seattle, yeah. And we actually stayed at the – we, we did not stay in Seattle. We stayed at, stayed at the Red Roof Inn in Bellevue, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> I don't know if that place is still there or not, but uh, that's where we stayed. And, uh, you know, that, that was my first time visiting Seattle, beautiful city and everything, but, uh, you know – Unfortunately, we didn't we didn't win the national title at that time. You know, I felt that we were the best team in college basketball, but um, I believe that we overlooked Michigan at the time that we were there. We were looking towards uh, saying that we were going to play Duke in the finals. Uh, at least I was, you know, I, because we had beaten Michigan twice, and you know, it seemed like that if everything worked out the way according to plan, it would be Illinois versus Duke in the finals. Unfortunately, it was Seton Hall in Michigan. And I think a lot of people remember that game, but we'll, we'll move on. I mean, that yeah. was, I, I think uh, you probably had better experiences than the Red Roof in, in Bellevue, no offense, <laughs> the Red Roof yeah. in. Uh, but, but that really was the, I mean, that great team uh, that introduced you to a lot of people in the NBA fifth overall pick uh, in Charlotte. How would you, how, how would you think your career started there in Charlotte? You played with a guy that I think uh, people who don't know the NBA uh, now follow on Twitter a lot, Rex Chapman. Yeah, actually, I just got off of a off of a podcast uh, with Rex just a few minutes ago, you know. So, so I did his, and now I'm doing yours. But yeah, I was drafted 
fifth by the Charlotte Hornets. And, you know, I, at first I didn't understand why they drafted me because they had Rex already. They had Dale Curry. I didn't understand why they needed another two guard. So, but they drafted me and then, you know, it, it worked out. They said, you know, we're going to take the best player available. And um, that's what I was told at least. And we'll say, and, and once you come here, Kendall, it, it will all work itself out. And it did, you know, and, but I'm still friends to, to this day with Rex, really good friends with him really good friends with Dale Curry, Muggsy Bogues, and all those guys. And you had a great first year, all, all rookie uh, NBA team, NBA rookie, uh, all first team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it turned out, you know, really well for me because I was apprehensive at first, like I said, because I did not want to compete for a position with my friend Rex. Rex and I have been friends since high school. Uh, didn't know Dale, but I didn't want to compete, you know, with, with Dale either. Um, but you know, it turned out that it worked for the best. I was moved to the point guard position for a little bit. Um, it, it allowed me to learn the game from that position. And then when I was able to move to the two guard position, um, opposite Muggsy Bogues the next year, things really took off for me. And then a couple of years go by and there's that, that 1993 trade to the Sonics. I, I, I hate to say it for both you and I, but 30 years ago, 30 years ago now, 1993? Yeah, 30 years ago, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember the trade at the time. I almost thought it was a fleecing for the Sonics, right? Uh, mm. Bob Witts had even said publicly, made a comment that they were giving up, the Sonics were giving up a couple of role players for for you, for a star, for a defensive guy, a, a mm. slasher. Uh, what do you remember about how that trade went down and, and your feelings at the time with Charlotte and your feelings at the time with uh, Seattle? Well, listen, I, I have to be honest with you. Um, you know, back then I was a young kid. Um, I was enamored with uh, uh, playing in a big city, um, which is part of the reason why I, I left Charlotte. If I, had, if I had to do it all over again, I probably would not have left Charlotte. Um, I, I was playing with Larry Johnson, Alonzo Mourning. Um, Muggsy Bogues, Dale Curry, we had just taken the Knicks to five games in the playoffs when I left. Um, and I didn't understand that a rising tide lifts all boats. Okay, this is this is the the, the young Kendall Gill, okay? And, uh, you know, I, I, left, I, I left there and I didn't understand what I was leaving. But fortunately for me, I was still going into a great situation with the Sonics because they had a powerhouse, a juggernaut, uh, waiting to win an NBA championship, you know, and uh, with Sean Kemp, uh, Gary Payton, Ricky Pierce, Sam Perkins, Vincent Askew, uh, Michael Cage, and all those guys. I didn't know those guys when I, when I first came over, uh, but I quickly learned to like them, and I, and I, and I quickly learned uh, that this team my first year was probably the best team in the NBA at that point. Um, and so once the move was made, I adjusted and, and you know, I, I embraced uh, the Sonics, the, the, the Northwest culture. And, you know, I really had a great time, you know, my, my, my first year there. I really did. And it's unfortunately that we were, and we may talk about this later, but I mean, it's unfortunately that we weren't able to win a championship with that team because I felt that that was, that was a team ready made to win a championship. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the year, of course, 63 and, and 19, that 1994 team. Uh, that was a team that had six guys averaging double figures, but no 20-point scorer. Do you think that kind of team exists in today's modern NBA? No, no, no. Yeah, that was the definition of a team. Yeah, that was the definition of a team because, you know, you look back and most of the players play, uh, played only about 31, 32 minutes a game. Okay, that was done – um, by design uh, to, to rest players and to keep players fresh. Um, you didn't really see any guys playing 36, 38 minutes a game. And that's something that I had to adjust to because when I was with, with Charlotte coming, coming uh, from Charlotte, I was playing 38 minutes a game. Um, so that, that's something that I had, to, I had to, to, to get used to. But, I mean, it turned out that it was, it was a good strategy because – you know, we, we would blow teams out. We would, we would, we would sit down in the fourth quarter. Uh, we would be fresh a lot, a lot of the times. Um, you know, I, I really like 
the format um, that the coaching staff had, had put together the first year and everything. So, you know, I was pleasantly surprised when I got there. Yeah, I don't think a lot of uh, Sonics fans want to revisit what happened at the <laughs> end yeah, of the yeah, season. Still... They're still, <laughs> they're yeah, still yeah. an image that I think of uh, Dikembe Mutombo burned into everybody's uh, yeah. mind. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the basketball, yeah. I mean, uh, what do you what do you think about that season in particular? I mean, that was the the season that it, it seemed like everything was coming together. It did, and uh, you know, we we won sixty three games, and and it got to the point where uh, the coaching staff put together a goal sheet for every game. If if we held the team under eighty five points, day off. If we scored one hundred twenty one points, day off. So. That's a big reason why we played so hard all the time during that year is because we love having days off, you know. And and if we could get the job done, then you know we we get it we get a free day off. And uh, you know it was fun playing with Gary, playing with Sean Kemp, of course, who's one of the best players I've ever played with, both he and Gary. Um, seeing the excitement uh, in the stadium at all times, you know, sold out every game. Uh, how loud the fans were. We were always on national TV that year. Um, people truly expected us to win that NBA title that year. They really did. Well, and, and that was a season two. I mean, uh, people have written books about this, but in the mid nineties in Seattle, you know, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden uh, yeah. were just rocking. The Sonics were intertwined with that, the energy in the city, I think, you know, you, you look back in, in time and that was a special moment for people, despite what happened in, in the playoffs. What do you what do you remember about to Seattle and your your time here uh, besides the Red Roof Inn in Bellevue? <laughs> <laughs> well, a really, really cool place. At first, I, I felt kind of out of place because, you know, I'm from Chicago. I still live here, uh, played in Charlotte. But th- Seattle seems so far away f- for me. You know, and uh, it was so different. You know, I was not used to seeing mountains and I was not used to seeing, you know, uh, uh, people that 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 listen to Pearl Jam and, and, and things like that. And um, I wasn't used to going across. I believe that was the I-90 bridge or 5 bit 20 or 5 bit You got them both, the I-90 and the 520, yeah. Okay, the 520. You know, I, I was not used to going across bodies of water like that, looking in the back. <laughs> And how beautiful it was and everything. I'm, I'm like a, a, a concrete jungle guy, you know, I'm not used to seeing all this natural beauty. So, and that's one of the, that's one of the things that I tell people that have never been to Seattle. I said, listen, man, if, if that city were on the East Coast, everybody would live there, <laughs> you know, because it is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, you know, and being young, I think I was 23, 24 years old. And I, I really couldn't appreciate what, where I was living and where, what, you know, how to take it all in. Um, if I had to do it all over again, you know, you're talking to a grown man. I was, I was a kid. I mean, but if, if I had to do it all over again in Seattle, was, I mean, I would, I would totally embrace the culture and, and, and the city and all it had to offer back then. Um, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, I was just playing basketball coming in and out and, uh, uh, you know, going to the stadium, going to practice, and, and that's it. I wouldn't explore the city or, you know, go out that much. Uh, but I tell you, if I had to do it all over again, I tell you what, I, that, oh, that's exactly what I would do. I would really get into uh, what the city had to offer. Well, and, and a lot of time has passed, um, and I want to delve into that with you. Um, mm-hmm. In terms of uh, Coach Carl, you just talked about the the teams, and I know – there was a, a lot written at the time uh, mm-hmm. about uh, the coach and your relationship with the coach. Now that time has passed, how would you, when you look back at this, um, how would how would you explain that relationship? Have you had a chance to talk to to Coach Carl since? No, we, I, you know, I still don't have a good relationship with George. Um, you know, when I was with the years after, you know, our our time together, you know. George and I spoke, we shook hands and, you know, I apologized for my part in, in, in what had happened back in uh, my second season in, in um, Seattle. And I thought that the, that the hatchet had been buried, but, you know, then he wrote a book uh, and, and said that I was, 
you know, a bad teammate and, and things like this, which, you know, he was the guy that told me that, Kendall, you're too unselfish to be a superstar. So, you know, I don't understand. So help me understand how am I too unselfish to be a superstar, but I'm a bad teammate, <laughs> you know? Um, so the, the feeling of, of, that I have towards, towards George, it's, it's not the same, but you know, it is, is what it was when I was 24 years old. But, you know, I, I could just say we, we, we still wouldn't sit down and have lunch together. <laughs> <laughs> Iconic Sonics with guest host Chris Daniels and his special guest Kendall Gill brought to you by Simply Seattle. Simply Seattle is the biggest Sonics apparel store in the world, locally owned by Sonics fans. And Simply Seattle also outfits many of the guests with the very best Sonics gear in the world. The guests on our show, they get cool Sonics gear. You can get cool Sonics gear too. Just go to simplyseattle.com and use the code ICONIC15, Simply Seattle. Our show is also brought to you by the legendary Edgewater Hotel, Seattle's only overwater hotel with unobstructed views of the Puget Sound and the Olympic Mountains. The Edgewater is the official hotel of Sonics fans everywhere. Welcome back to Iconic Sonics. I'm Chris Daniels, joined again by Kendall Gill. 30 years ago, you were open then about the importance of mental health. It was rare mm. for an athlete for, uh, like you to do what you did. and. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're around the sport now, and it, and it seems like uh, the times have changed. Kevin Love, in particular, has talked about that. How do you think those conversations have changed uh, over time in the last 30 years? The conversations have become much more acceptable um, because other players since, uh, I, I believe that was in 93 or 94 that that happened um, with me, uh, that so many more players have come out and talked about mental health. Uh, talked about the importance of it and letting other people know that just because we dribble a basketball, athletes make tons of money and um, that it still isn't all sunshine and rainbows. You know, you, you do uh, at times have, pro have things that you have to deal with in life, just like a regular person. Um, you know, in my situation in Seattle, and, and I've never told the story before I ever even talked about it, uh, it's part of the reason why, you know, I, I, I was open to doing your uh, podcast here um, is I used to suffer from cluster headaches. OK, I suffered from cluster headaches from the time I was 10 years old to up until my last year in, in the NBA. OK, what I used to go through is I would go it, it would be seasonal. So I would go through an episode in the fall, an episode in the winter, an episode in the spring maybe an episode in the summer, but during the episodes, I would have six to seven headaches a day. These headaches are unbearable, like migraines, okay? At that time, when I, when I did have to, have, have to take the break, um, I remember, because my first year I lived in Bellevue, had a, and then after the, after my first year, I moved to downtown Seattle to an apartment. So I was at my apartment and I used to take this shot called Imitrex. And what Imitrex is, is you, you, it's a shot that you put in your arm to stop the headache right away, okay? You're only supposed to take two a day. My episodes were so bad, I was taking six to seven of those shots every day to try to make it go away, okay? The headaches would not stop. They were even worse when I went to sleep and woke up. So during a three day span, I did not go to sleep and I was totally exhausted. I remember going to a game and uh, we were playing in Tacoma back then. This was at the Tacoma Dome. I remember trying to drive into the game, almost falling asleep in the car because I hadn't slept in three days. So I eventually called the NBA Players Association and told them what a, what a problem I was having. And they told me, look, we need, you need to take a break right now. And, you know, I still didn't think it was depression or anything like that. I just, you know, I just thought that I was going through uh, one of my cluster headache episodes. 
but on, but you know, and I still rejected that I was depressed for a long time. You know, and that's and, and that's part of us as, as as men. We're not supposed to be um, depressed. We're supposed to be strong enough to take anything on. That's what frame of mind I was in. Okay, so I, I wouldn't accept the, the the depression part of it. Um, years later, I did, but because you know, insomnia is part can be a byproduct of depression. You know, and so the NBA uh, actually had the NBA's head of the, the medical staff happened to be in Seattle at that time. So he asked me to come and meet with him. I went and met with him. And he said, listen, I'm, I'm recommending right now that you stop playing for a while, at least until we can get these headaches under control and until you can get some rest. If you continue on, this is going to be dangerous for you. So that's when we announced it. And, and, and that's the true story. That's what happened. And, uh, you know, I was able to get some rest. And I think I came back maybe a week and a half later. Headaches were still there, but I was still, but I was able to sleep. And, and that, uh, that's what enabled me to come back and play. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, Kendall. The, yeah. do, you, do you think that really anybody around you at the time had any idea of what you were going through? Uh, no, the trainer, the trainer did. Uh, he knew that I was going through the, the episodes with the headaches, but nobody else did, you know, and it was, it was tough. I'll tell you, I, I've been suffering from that for my, my whole life ever since I was 10 years old. But in, in that particular time in Seattle, it was the worst, you know, and I just, I mean, it, it got to a point where, where my head was hurting so bad that I, 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 I wanted to just jump off the balcony you know, to end the pain that was, that, that I couldn't get rid of, you know, especially after using all of the Imitrex shots and things like that, and they wouldn't work anymore. So. How much did you pay attention to what people were writing at the time? Cause it was like, well, Kendall Gill is, is, has disappeared from the team for one reason or another. And, and you're mm -hmm. still, you're, you're fighting this on your own, your own battle. Well, you know, thank God I, I've got parents. You know, you know, my parents are still living, still here uh, now. They still <laughs> guide me even to this day. I'm 54 years old now, but uh, I didn't pay. The, the, my mom and dad came back because I came home to Chicago for a couple of days to get to get rest and see see some doctors and everything about my head and everything. Once once we took care of that, my parents flew back to Seattle with me. They would not let me read any newspapers. They would not let me, you know, really watch the news or anything. They stayed with me. And, you know, that's how I got through it. I, I don't, I, I assume that, that all of the, all of the reports were not good, you know, but, you know, I was willing to, t to, to take the heat because I, I had to take care of myself, you know, and I, I did that. And, you know, I'm glad that I did, you know, because had I not taken that step, who knows what would have happened. How are you doing with it today? I mean, uh, are, are you able to manage it? Has it have, have the... Oh, I don't have them anymore. So, yeah. so what happened is that we finally found a protocol that broke the cycle of the headaches. Um, and, you know, I've been doing that protocol ever since. Do I, do I get one every once in a while? I may get one as opposed to hundreds of headaches a year. I probably get one or two now a year. So, you know, thank God for, for science and technology that I don't have to suffer like I did throughout my career. Have you reached out to other athletes who may have experienced the same thing? I mean, we're, we're talking about the idea of, of people openly talking about this mm -hmm. and the, the connection with mental health. What you're saying is it affected your physical health, too. I mean, have you have you had a chance to talk to other athletes and, and try and help them find the light? I have talked to I've, I've talked to a couple um, that reached out to me you know, about the situation that I went through, you know, and, uh, you know, I told them that, listen, you got to take care of yourself first. You can't listen to everybody else. There's a lot of pressures on you as a professional athlete, um, you know, to perform one, because you're getting paid a lot of money. You know, you have that pressure. You have the pressure of the fans to, to perform. You had the pressure of the coach to, to perform as well, because the coach has to keep his job as well, you know, and you can't worry about, those pressures when it comes to your life and uh you know that's what i did you know a lot of people would ask me you know well you know kendall 
he, he, he would walk around and, you know, sometimes he would not want to be engaged in, in, in team activities or with his teammates. And everything. You know, the reason why is because my head was pounding so hard. I, I just wanted it to stop, you know, and, and, and I wasn't always like that, but during the seasons in which I would have these headaches, that's the way I would be. I would be withdrawn because I, I, I could not, focus or I could not talk to anybody else because I was going through so much pain, you know, and I, and I didn't want to tell anybody because like I said, going back to, to being a, uh, a, a strong, capable athlete, you don't want to admit any weakness at all. And that's the, that's the phase that I was in at that time. You know, I didn't want to, tell, I, I, I just wanted to deal with it by myself. So it sounds like you felt too, that you were misunderstood. I knew I was misunderstood because they, they, they didn't know what I was, I was going through at the time, you know, uh, had, had they felt, uh, look, I, I wouldn't wish cluster headaches on my worst enemy, you know, because the pain is just unbearable. Um, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't, because it happened to me so much. I didn't want my teammates or anybody else to think, Oh, well, this kid is weak. You know, he's always sick, something's wrong with him. So I decided to just deal with it myself until I couldn't deal with it anymore. Do you, do you feel like, uh, I mean, you ended up getting traded back to Charlotte. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think that that uh, helped, helped change the situation? I mean, you said they were, the, the headaches were worst in Seattle. Um, after you got traded back to Charlotte, did the situation improve? Did the, did the climate around you improve? No, they didn't improve anymore uh, <laughs> but it never got to the point where it did in Seattle when I couldn't sleep for three days in a row you know it never got to that point anymore I was able to manage it a lot better um, I did not they did not go completely away until I was in my uh, 13th year you know and then, then they went. I, I, I can tell you. I can be honest. With you, I, I played half of my career with the migraine. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, but I was able to deal with it because I had, I had, I was able to manage it because I had dealt with it for years and years and years. Well, and you had a 15-year career. Uh, you, you eventually, yeah, like I said, got traded back to Charlotte from Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, and you in April of 1999, April 3rd, 11 steals in a game. NBA steals leader that season uh, to this day with so many three pointers and the way the game has changed. You don't hear as much about steals anymore. Right. And, <laughs> what was it about uh, stealing the ball that, that was so important to your game and, and you were able to focus on that, especially uh, there in the late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. Um, well, you know, when Nate, Gary and I were, were on the Sonics, we, we used to steal the basketball all the time. I mean, I, I've, I've had a knack for stealing the basketball my whole basketball career, even when I was in high school. I still had a record in, at, at my high school for, for like 13 steals in one game. But um, that day, and I, and I can tell you, while Clyde Frazier told me this, he said, you know, he, he knew I was a ball hawk. So he gave me advice. He saw me going out to steals at the beginning of the game all the time because, you know, playing in New Jersey, uh, for six years and, and, and him being a commentator for the Knicks. He got a chance to watch him play a lot. So he said, don't go for the first three steals of the game. The reason why is because when, say, for instance, you're in a close game, that player is going to throw that same pass into a lane and you'll be able to steal it, and that can make the difference in the game. He said, but if you close up the lane now, they're not, they'll never be able to throw it. Uh, they, they, if, if you go for it now, they won't throw it later on in the game. So actually in that game against Miami, I let the first three go by me, you know, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to steal it. But then I just picked it up. They stayed, they, they just kept throwing it. I, I'm like, okay, you guys want to keep throwing, I'm going to steal it. You know, I ended up with 13. I could have really had 14, but, you know, I let the first three go by. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the game has certainly changed, right? You just said it. You and, and Nate and GP were all known for steals. Nate led the league two one year. Um, you hear more about the three point. I mean, you just look at the three point numbers and the three points, uh, three pointers attempted in today's game. Um, how do you think this game has changed over the course of uh, 30 years? It's a lot easier. 
It's a, I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, here, here, go, here come the old heads and things like that. But I mean, it, I was watching Adrian Wojnarowski on the ESPN a couple of weeks ago. And he said that, well, he was talking about the the record explosion in scoring in, in uh, the NBA, because I think Luca had 60. Uh, Donovan uh, Mitchell had 71. Uh, Giannis had 50 something. Well, the game has been engineered on purpose to promote scoring. They took out the hand checking rules. There's a no take foul. Uh, they allow you to travel with the basketball now. <laughs> they allow you to carry the basketball now. I mean, it's if you take all the advantages away from the defensive man, that's what's going to happen. Guys are going to score 60 and 70 something points. It's not that the players and, and, I, and I get into arguments with my friends here in Chicago all the time is always hey the players are better now than they were no they're not uh, they we would have adapted the same way that these players have adapted to the rules we would if, if, if the game back then called for us to take three-point shots we would have practiced it a lot more and we would have made three-point shots they're making now um you know with the defense that's being played now that's why you can see seven foot guys handle the basketball out on the perimeter and get all the way to the basket with their Euro steps and everything. The reason why is because there's no, they, they, they have no physicality of the game. There's, there's no hand checking anymore. There's no, if you, if you give a hard foul, it's a flagrant two, you get kicked out of the game, you know? So that's, it's just a much easier game to play than it used to be. And, it's gotta be wild for you too, to, to watch the game with uh, the, the likes of Steph Curry, just, launching it at all the all all places all time when you played with his dad right yeah yeah and and, and his dad was a great shooter but his dad never just <laughs> dribbled one foot across the court and launched it you know he always got in his he always got just beyond the three-point line and knocked it down and you know i do i've been doing chicago bulls games here as a, a studio analyst now for 16 years so I've seen the game change uh, from the time I was in it to the time I started doing my um, analysis to now. And, you know, the three-point shots that these guys take now, we would have been taken out of the game for and sat on the bench for a while if we ever did that. You know, and, you know, I know analytics have come into play for uh, the NBA game, but, you know, a lot of these shots I don't agree with. You know, you, you, these guys are shooting, I think they average 31 three-point shots a game uh, in today's era where when back in the 90s, we averaged seven three-point shots a game. You know, so it, it's really taking a hold. And, and I think that, you know, it, sometimes it sends the wrong messages to kids too. But I, I have two kids uh, here in, in Chicago. One of them is a pretty good basketball player. He may have a chance if he keeps working hard, but... You know, when I go to the AAU games or the high school games, these kids are chucking up shots and they're horrible shots, you know? And I'm like, where's where the game gone, you know? Well, yeah, you just mentioned it. Catch uh, catch folks up on on all the stuff you're doing in Chicago, not only the the Bulls telecast. I saw that you, you got deep into boxing. You're still, like, a big fan of the sport. You're doing some boxing at a time, big into fitness. Yeah. Seems like you got going a lot, a lot going on. Yeah, I do. I have a, I'm, I'm big into boxing. Actually, after I retired from uh, basketball, I, I went and had four pro fights. Um, I studied jujitsu and Muay Thai boxing six years before I retired. So I was into combat sports and I used to box when I was a kid. But, you know, when my mom and dad moved us from the city to the suburbs. There was no more boxing. So I had to play other things. So uh, I wouldn't realize my childhood dream of becoming a professional boxer. I had four fights and, you know, I still train you know, hard to this day. Um, I also have a fitness club called the 6040 club in which I started during the pandemic. I started it by accident. You know, I asked a friend of mine to come out and, and run with me. And, you know, we started putting our workouts on social media and it grew from two people to 270 people a day coming to one football field doing this program that I do. So, and also, you know, like you mentioned, you know, I've been doing the Bulls games here now for 16 years. Uh, and I, it's allowed me to stay in touch with the game, you know, and, and, you know, I'm really grateful for the Bulls organization and NBC Sports Chicago for, for allowing me to, to do what I love to do, you know, and, uh, I'm living, I'm, I'm, re I work, but I'm retired. So <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a good mix. <laughs>
And you've been constantly around the league. Um, and so let's talk, because you, you do have some great perspective. Talk about a couple of markets, and, and we'll talk about Seattle in a second. But first, Charlotte, you know, with with the tie to Chicago, meaning uh, Michael Jordan, um, mm-hmm. you know, that that's a franchise you've been involved with. Um, you've seen it uh, since Michael Jordan has taken over. Uh, but they that that's a franchise uh, that that never has really seemed to to get elevated to another level. There, what do you what do you think's missing in Charlotte? Well. The one thing Charlotte has to do, and it's the same thing as when I played there, is that you have to build through the draft. You're not going to get a major free agent in Charlotte because it's a small market team. It, it, it's, it's not looked at as the glamour uh, market. Most, most guys that, that are A-list free agents are looking at big markets. This is L.A., Chicago, New York, uh, Miami, um, places like that maybe a Phoenix. Um, so what you have to do is you have to build through the draft. You, ha- you have to draft a guy like uh, LaMelo Ball, which they've done. You have to keep his talent in Charlotte, much like they did with uh, myself, Larry Johnson, and Lonzo Morton. They built that team through the draft. That was three consecutive years that they drafted us. And you have to have the ability to retain their services because you know that other larger market teams are going to come after those guys when uh, when their time is up as a free agent or when their time has come as a free agent. And that's exactly what happened um, with myself. I was first to go to Seattle. And then Alonzo Mourning, when I, when I was traded back to the Charlotte Hornets, Alonzo Mourning was poached by the Miami Heat, you know, simply because of a $10 million difference, yeah. you know. And, and if, they had, if the Charlotte Hornets had paid – the $110 million, um, dollar diff- $110 million that Zoe was looking for, they would have been able to retain the services, you know, and then it would probably have been, been me, Larry, and Zoe uh, for the next five or six years. But instead, when Alonzo left, that led to me being traded to New Jersey and led to Larry Johnson being traded to New York. So that's the thing. You have to draft well. And you have to be able to retain the services of the guys who you draft. And then Charlotte got traded to New Orleans. And all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Charlotte went to New Orleans. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that sets up the natural uh, question about Seattle. Um, since you're so actively involved in, in the Bulls telecasts and watch uh, the NBA and, and talk to people on a daily basis, uh, what do you think about uh, this city, Seattle, getting a, a team back? It's been – now we're, we're talking about year 15, 2008, since the Sonics left Seattle. Look, you know, a lot of people will say, I had my differences with George Carl, okay? But Seattle is one of the top five cities, in my opinion, in the NBA when they have a team. One of the top five. I mean, all the times that even when I wasn't a Sonic, when I came to play there, the fan support was there. The, the, the beautiful city was there. I mean, the, the environment was there. They deserve a team. You know, I, I felt like even, even when, when you guys lost the Sonics, I felt as a, as a former Sonic, I felt bad for the city, you know, um, because I knew how, how, much the, how much the Sonics meant to the fans there. You know, I knew how much they were ingrained in the culture there, you know. So, you know, it's, it was a sad day, but, you know, hopefully, you know, I thought you guys were going to get the Sacramento Kings. You know, I, I did. I was, I, I, I was, I was, had my fingers crossed and everything, but unfortunately it didn't happen. Hopefully the NBA soon will, will put a franchise back there because, I mean, it, it's, it's just a great place to play, man. I, you know, if I, if I had a, been on better terms with Georgia. It had been a different uh, coach there. I would have loved to have stayed there for, for the rest of my career. Well, and you've had a chance too to see uh, you 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 played with Jamal, correct? Jamal. Oh yeah, yeah, I did in Chicago. Yes. And, and what he's done here in Seattle in, in terms of growing the game and and the, mm-hmm. the summer pro am and. You know, Zach Levine now is, is one of those guys who has come back and, and played and 
It, yeah. it, you really could have a, an entire NBA roster made up of Seattle or Seattle area guys. I mean, what, what do you think that says about this marketplace? You're calling it top five, you think, if, if a team ever comes back. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, one, uh, you're forgetting uh, Isaiah Thomas as well, yeah. the Seattle guy. Um, you know, because the Sonics, I believe, were so popular there, that inspires the younger talent to get to want to be a son one day, you know, or, or, or play in the league. And I think that's what you've seen in Zach Levine. That's what you've seen in Jamal Crawford, Isaiah Thomas. Uh, those guys aspired to play on that stage simply because that city, that team was in that city, you know, uh, and, 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 and the legacy of the rain man, legacy of the glove, you know, those things live on. Those things don't ever die, you know. And uh, I understand Sean still lives in Seattle. He does. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the greatest Sonics of all time still lives in the city, you know, and, and that's something to be said. And if there's ever a team you'll be back doing Bulls broadcasts, hopefully with the Sonics in Seattle. Yeah. I mean, hey, listen, if, if Seattle ever got a team, uh, again, I, I would love to come out there and do broadcast. Uh, you know, my wife, you know, once the boys leave uh, and go to go to college and everything, she she wants to get out of here. So, so hey, and, and she's always talking about Seattle. So I'd love to come back. Well, Kendall Gill, uh, again, the resume that I don't have: NBA rookie, All First Team, NBA steals leader in '99, most steals in one game, eleven in in that '99 year, scored almost thirteen thousand points in the NBA, and of course is an iconic Sonic. Thank you for spending all this time with us and, and, and for your honesty and, and, and good luck going forward. No, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Thanks, Kendall. All right. There you have it. Another great edition of Iconic Sonics. Thanks to Chris Daniels for handling the hosting chores today. And thanks to Kendall Gill for spending time reminiscing on the 93, 94 and 94, 95 seasons here in Seattle with the Sonics. Thanks to all of our sponsors as well. And you can get more information about Iconic Sonics by visiting IconicSonics.com. I'm Mike Gastineau. We'll see you next time.